Well, I just found out some stuff recently. I never wondered why, you know, because um, Dad was a school teacher, superintendent of schools in Iowa, and uh, he really never talked much about it except I did remember that I'd had a paper route as a kid back there, which had to be somewhere eight years old. I delivered the papers, and one Christmas, I knew Dad smoked a cigar once in a while. So I went to the pool hall and bought a cigar for him. <laughs> and I came home with it, gave that to him for Christmas. My, my folks turned white <laughs> because apparently he was in the contract. He was not, not supposed to smoke. Oh. <laughs> so I often wondered if that was why he, they came to Colorado. He lost, might have lost his job, but apparently it wasn't. It, they really were sick and tired of the Iowa rules that they were living under as teachers. And there, there were, Donaldson is close to Fort Madison and Keokuk and used to love to go down there with folks even as a little kid. And one of the, the real nice big paddle wheel dance boats for they'd go down the river to St. Louis and back the next morning. You know. And my, this stuff that I just found in Tucson, it also apparently had squirreled away. You know, it was stuff that my mother had written and said, that as young people, which they were at that time, that they would love to have gone down to Fort Madison or Keokuk and taken the dance boat, dancing at night and so forth. But they were not allowed to be seen at a public dance. They were not, uh, they had to be available on Sundays to teach Sunday school or Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and stuff like that. And we were just under the blue nosed way of life back there. And so finally, well, that summer, summer of 28, well, we'd been in Boulder, Dad was working on our master's degree over there, and we came up to visit my grandmother's aunt, who this house is Donna Reddy's, who was a two-room cabin. If you look at it and see the ridge going from the river to the road, where that was all there was. The front was kitchen, living, the other room was in the bedroom and an outhouse and that type of thing. Of course, when they built the tunnel road, where the Bureau of Reclamation bought it, and it had been enlarged a lot through those years. And uh, so uh, they were evacuated. But anyhow, we'd come to visit Aunt Mabel, my grandmother's sister. And uh, they fell in love with Grand Lake and bought the three lots right below there where Chris is. And, and what, year was, said, what year did you move here? Well, at 29, it follows 28 and 29 is when. And part of the things that Mother wrote was uh, he locked the, the schoolhouse, took the keys down to the head of the school board, handed him the keys and said, I'm done, and took a cigar out of his pocket and left. <laughs> <laughs> so they must have been renegades ahead of time. They were more than just, I thought they were hippies before <laughs> hippies were cool, you know. But. And, so, and you were eight then, At right? some point along there, because yeah. having an October birthday, well, that's kind of screwed right. me up. A lot of that stuff was the summer of 28 and so forth. How many people lived here then? Well, after we had the house built, and I'm not sure earlier, but like in the mid 30s, why well, uh, there were no doors on the bedrooms upstairs. And the first one, well, the first was a three room mom and dad's bed. Jody and I had two corners of the living room, and the kitchen was in a different room. And then they put the addition on and put a second story on and a potential bathroom. <laughs> and we would count people from, oh, basically as far down as we knew people, you know, which would be about halfway to Granby the Ranches and so forth. And up in the park where it was Holdsworth and a few up there. And we would you know, try to keep count. There's only about 75 people in this whole area. Do you know how your Aunt Mabel got here? No, all I know is she was married before and came here and married a homesteader who was, had been a, in the Army, and this was right after World War I at some point or other, I'm not even sure. What was her last name? Hall. First time was short. And she moved here from Iowa, do you know when? 
Sometime before you. I never knew her until <clears throat> met her here. You know, you're talking about me eight years old. Yeah. I'm probably a little foggy on yeah, some of this stuff. <laughs> so you grew up in the house that Chris lives in now. That was, well, our first place we lived while we were building the place was where John and Sally Aston had the tall pine forge. Really? It was a two-room cabin that we moved, rented from Clyde Esley's mother. Do, do you know which house that is? Mm -hmm. That's the one right next door to Pam Coonrod's where you oh, used to. Cool. Right behind the bowling alley. Where all the junk cars and everything is. That, yeah, that was one of them. Last so you lived there while this house was being come, built? Yeah. You know, that summer. And then, of course, Dad got a two-year contract teaching school in Hot Sulphur. So fall came while we went to Hot Sulphur and lived there two different years. The first year where we lived. Um, I have pictures that show Hot Sulphur Springs in the old, old days, and I pointed out the house. The location of the house is where the jail is right now. Hmm. Hmm. So and then you came back here and your dad taught here, or...? He was superintendent. Later he, had, he did a one year here, but, and I don't remember some because I know he taught here, but we were, before that, why, after his two year contract was up on that, why, we, he was director of relief, which was commodities and so forth, in the 30s when the depressions were on there. And he traveled around with powdered milk and flour, sugar, all the stuff that the government had made available, you know. To, people. And uh, we'd have been eating that if it hadn't been, he got the job distributing it, you know. Was there anybody that you grew up with that's still around? Well, when you say grew up with it, why? Before no. the war. But yes, but no, it's a, you got a strange question. <laughs> uh, across the street from where I we lived the first year. It was the McLean family, which was Barney McLean, who was probably one of the top skiers, of, probably more hardware than anybody else. And uh, in July, I went to Margaret, his wife. Barney passed away about seven, eight years ago. And uh, during the war, why Elsie and Margaret were basically chums, buddies, lived together in the same complex which belonged to Elsie's folks. And uh, so they, all of the old pictures, the cheesecake and everything else that Elsie and Margaret would send to Barney and I, Barney was with the uh, Air Force and Air Sea Rescue, and I was traveling around, going different places. Started in Fort Lewis, Washington, back to California, then to Camp Hale, or out of Camp Hale, and out to Fort Ord, did up the Lucians, and then we were after Japs there, and they snuck out in the night, so we didn't shoot any of them, but we shot each other. So-called friendly fire is easy when you have a hot shot. Lieutenant says, okay, men, set up a perimeter here and shoot anything that's moving. <laughs> so, but not everybody got the message. So now, were you in the 10th Mountain Division then? <clears throat> there wasn't the 10th Mountain yet. There wasn't. So t you've told me this before, but I forgot the details. It was the 87th Mountain Infantry. It was the 87th Mountain Infantry. And was that which later out of became... Colorado? Hmm? Was that out of Colorado? Well, it was out of Fort Lewis, Washington to okay. start with, because they were still building Camp Hale. Is that what you mean, or is that to explain? What I'm trying to say. Okay, but the, how did that move into the 10th Mountain Division? It was planned ahead by the head, honchos, but you know, we were really the original part of that. 85th and 86th and the 90th came along later that made up the, the 10th Mountain Division. And then, so where were, where were you in the war? The Aleutians and. We came back to the States and. Yep, put her at the 90th to help. Since I was a battle exposed, I was supposed to teach the leftover cab drivers and watermelon pickers <laughs> what it was like, you know. And then that was a long story. I came back to her up here on a, for leave, and first the pass was closed, and I didn't hurry back. Finally, I felt guilty and called in, and went down the back way down through Breckenridge to Colorado Street. We were camping. Carson at that time, and uh, 
else went with me and took the car you know, for some unknown reason. He got here and I said, oh, it's a good thing you got here. We're shipping out in the morning. <laughs> the first clue we had, so we sent out to Fort Ord again to overseas replacements. And of course, all of us had been, there were just about, oh, 50 of us that had been with the 87th where they Bits and squalled, and we were going a wall. We were, we knew the waitresses at the best restaurants in town in Monterey, and, and uh, this is so much baloney that it's. So then, where did, where did they ship you out to? From from South Pacific, and, and then uh, well, basically we went to New Caledonia, which was basically just off the coast of Australia. And I was by a convoy. We were over a month even getting there. Many, many ships. And then uh, you were assigned there, a big complex tent. To, they were taking this boatload of guys before we were going to send them. And this guy that interviewed me said, oh, Grand Lake. So I was a sea scout in Denver. I said, well, you must have been one of the guys that was kids on the beach that we would shoot at with our beanies. <laughs> <laughs> so we bonded immediately and had a big gab about Grand Lake and so forth. And so then you came back to Grand Lake and you and Elsie got married? No. No. I, there were two years left. So anyhow, he said, do you want to stay in the infantry? And I said, no, I don't know anything about it. So he said, what have you been doing? I said, I've been working in the tunnel. And, uh, so we even inquired about the tool. You mean you're blasting and stuff? I said, yes. He said, well, like dynamite? Well, that's a Bahamas G. I said, well, probably one to two cases of shift, each shift I was on. And uh, he wrote me up as a demolition expert and sent me off to Tauga Tabu for, uh, with an ordnance detachment. And my first job was testing mortar shells. I, helps contribute to the beach. beachheads with cruisers shooting over the top of your landing bar. Well, that was wake you up and throw your ears away. But then we were testing mortar shells. We could just wait so you shoot them in a mortar shell and some would go out and go a long ways. It wouldn't go off. Some would did go off and we were close. So then I went from there to New Hebrides, which is French islands. And little town get to move, and then from there we were there about a year and a half, to two years, and uh, got there. And the executive officer said, Grand Lake, do you know anything about boats? And I said, Oh, a little bit. And he said, Well, he had an older type landing barge they wanted to use for ammunition movement around the island. But he didn't have enough to make it run, so could you make it run? So I was assigned to fix that for about several months. It became my personal plaything, kind of. <laughs> so I was inheriting a pretty good war. From there I went up, stopped off in New Guinea, and then to the Philippines. I was in Cebu, Cebu for a while, and still fighting there, and then on up to Luzon. And then from, I was there when they shut dropped the bomb on Japan, and we were getting ready to make an invasion of Japan. At that time, we were waterproofing all of our shop trucks and everything, so they could, you could, well, we were convertibles, you know, so we could stand on the seat and run, steer with our feet, and red snorkels on all the carburetors so it would be above water. But fortunately, we didn't have to. We got a dry land. We didn't have any opposition when you know, on the north end of Japan. I was there for, landed there at some time. August, of course, after the, I suppose probably two weeks after the bomb was dropped, and then stayed there until after Christmas. And the Missouri was still in Tokyo Bay when we took the train down from the north end, got on the troop ship, and came back to the U.S. We took the railroad, we commandeered the railroad, one engine and two cars for the rest of us to get down. <laughs> I don't even remember now, but I was the ranking non-com on the thing. 
Got a guy that would run the engine from wherever we were down south up to Denver until we go to Fort Lewis where we were, or Fort Logan where we were discharged. So you mentioned um, working on the tunnel before you went to the South Pacific. How did you get that job? What What was that like? I don't know how do you get a job. <laughs> I was 18, you know. I'd been working for the Park Service. And winter was coming on, and so the first at the start of the tunnel, the grill jumbo as such was still outside in the sunshine, and I was there when we grilled the first round off of it. And I'm saying things that you're probably looking at, and what the hell is he talking did, about? Did a team start on this side and a team start on the other side? Talk, talk about how that all how they all engineered that. Well, they walked it from Mary's Lake to this lake. From Ayers Lake? Hmm? From Ayers Lake? I didn't hear what you said. They walked it from foot from Mary's Lake. Mary's Lake, okay. To Grand Lake. And you see where the mountain goes up? And then leveled off a little bit. Yeah. Just a little ways above that high that point there. You can see a, a notch in the trees. Mm hmm You're looking right at the horizon. You see what I'm looking at her? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're looking clear at the top of the mountain. Mm hmm yeah, You see the notch in the trees up at the top? Mm-hmm. There was a cider up there. That was the exact line coming from from Mary's Lake. Bud mm -hmm. Zick held Walker's brother was one of the guys he did, and he just died a couple of years ago. But he was with the Bureau of Reclamation Survey crew to do that, and they came over the top. And then when we started the tunnel, we would be down in the... I can talk better with pictures. Do you want to look at it? You look. Um, I think that might be a little hard for... For yeah, the video, yeah, yeah. but if you, I mean, just a general overview of kind of how yeah. it, anyhow, how, yeah, how to get you're, there. You're asking more than general overview. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but it's like using that as a site, and then so they. Well, you would be down at the heading, which is where the tunnel starts. Mm -hmm. The heading is where they start grilling. And they would have their transit. They'd set their transit up there, be on the target, and they'd flip the transit over and aim it down the tunnel. Mm -hmm. There'd be a guy down there, and he'd make a mark of paint on the rock wall. And then he had a long handle paintbrush that was about six foot long. Dip it in a bucket of paint and then hold the bottom end to this and then make a full complete circle hmm. all the way around on hmm. that. And that's where he drilled. And what did they drill with? You're asking questions. <laughs> so, how, well, how long did it take to build a tunnel? I don't know. I, Yo, I, you went I to war. I was chasing Jeff's home. Mm. I came home. They were putting concrete. They had already put the concrete in the bottom, which is called the invert, which is like this. Mm -hmm. And it's a round tunnel. And they were still pouring cement, which were fancy big forms that collapsed. And there were about eight or ten of them. I don't even remember how many. But that would, uh, they, they would pour one full and then, uh, geez, I'm looking for I just saw some the other day. Yeah. I'm looking at the right place. Underwater up there at the end of the lake. This is what, what I came back and what I worked on. This was the house over here, Jeff Schneider's. Okay. You got me one more picture there. See this would this would go with this like this. See this. See, this is finished. Mm -hmm. and then this is more doing the 17 passageways that the water goes in over a weir and back and then down towards the tunnel. This is up by the the uh, transformers that are up above the tunnel now. But anyhow, that's where that all started. Anyhow, they finished concrete, 
No officers that worked on it were allowed to take our wives and take go through on our, our, our railroad tracks were still in. Hmm. We went over to Estes Park to Mary's Lake. <laughs> so then when did they actually open the tunnel? Do you remember? After the war. Yeah. After Lene was born? Before Lene yeah. was born. After Lene was born. Yeah. So 50-something. I, I was still teaching fly boys to walk when she was yeah. born. Okay, so then what did you do after you came back from the war? What did you do here? Well, I started the house, worked for the lumberyard, and then, as I said, he was killed in an airplane crash, and so I didn't have a job. And that's when I went to work teaching survival. They but said you were killed? No, Who my was boss killed? was killed. Oh, your boss was killed. And his widow didn't want to have anything to do with construction, so I was without a job. Had that she ran the lumber yard. And at that time, I was just finishing up the theater in Grand Lake, and he it had been sort of a joint operation between my boss and his wife and the drug store. And it's it more of the Jaegers that used to have to devil some. And so I was in charge of finishing it without a contract and so forth. Got the theater up and running, and Dick Thompson and I would compare wives because his wife was having Larry at about the same time Elsie was having Lene. And so, I was finishing the theater at that time. So you're talking about the theater by the Little Bear? No, I'm talking about in, Gra in Granby. Oh, in Granby. That my friend Hemar shore down. Ah. I didn't know that. So, so then, okay, so then after you got out of the lumber business, then you, then what? Then I went teaching survival. And where? In, in Camp Carson. And then we were expanding so long. We were taking all strategic air command and got the mats and so forth. And we need a bigger and better facility for our school. So uh, one of my jobs was to go out to Reno to State Air Force Base, which was a shut off, and uh, we just decided that it would be the place to go, so we would search areas, see where we would have our training taking place, and so far, fly out there on Monday morning in our own D.C. with our Jeeps and trailer, and we tried to make it back to Calneva or someplace on Lake Tahoe or at nightfall, and we clean up even from our backpack. And, and Go to the casinos. <laughs> so then when did you come back here and stay? Well, Elsie said we aren't going to raise kids in Reno. So I resigned and came here and hung out my own shingle. Building. And that was about what year? How old were the 53. kids? 53. And so... What are some of the things you built in Grand Lake? Well, I was building all over the county. I was in, built a lot of stuff over at Sea Lazy U, and of course I did the King Ranch. Yeah. Western Riviera, um, a um, Lakeview Motel, which is now the Village Center, the uh, Western Riviera. Then the condos up on the hill. There were somewhere there. There were duplexes, three duplexes up there. Same ownership on all of that stuff now. And then they built a house for Harvey Everest. And then one of the last jobs I did. Well, then of course I built like motels. The El Monte and Granby is torn down. A lot of stuff torn down. The theater there. Of course that was torn down with the. the uh, he borrowed the only grand page stuff. I don't know, I've forgotten. I have to go through my files. Yeah. Well, you built the Tappins, the Pat Henry house. Yeah, that was one of them. And then, of course, uh, Bob Appleman's. And uh, over at Campbell's, I did some, built the boathouse over mm -hmm. there. Just a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I, I was trying to think of anything else out on the lake. No. Yeah. So those three. Well, I built several homes, homes in Kremlin. So yeah. I built the clinic in for Dr. Sivianni and his house. And two or three houses down there that I built. And some in Granby. When I was 
working for the lumber yard there why I one time I had jobs going in three towns Grand Lake Tabernash uh, Granby and Kremlin and I ran the crew at each one of those so it was very time consuming that was before my boss so that, but that was all part of the post office and hot sulfur springs and stuff like that too I ate to uh, living. And where were you living then? Because your parents were still here. Yeah, the wintertime they were gone. They were in Arizona. And so where did you and Elsie and the kids live? Here. You built this house. And what year was that? that, you built? that well, I started in 47. Oh, oh, right. 48. Okay, 40, 48, 49. And it was just, this was there. Well, there was insulation in it and so forth. And, I put in a stairway when she came home from the hospital with Lame, so she didn't have to come up the ladder for inside <laughs> or use the outside stairway and things like that. No. Because I first toilet and shower I put in was in the basement. And we had the tub up here where that was it. So so we had inside plumbing, but it was rather beat the heck out of the old outhouse deal. You know? <laughs> so um, you didn't tell us earlier about how you met Elsie. Can you talk about Elsie a little bit? Oh, this is really romantic. <laughs> Where was Elsie born? <laughs> and then you can tell us how you met her. Because I don't think everybody knows where Elsie was born. Well, you aren't sitting in the right seat at the theater. <laughs> this, this has got to be more than <laughs> the Elsie was born on Ranch Creek. Have you been up to the Devil's Thumb? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's before you cross over Ranch Creek, going over to Black's house. You know what I'm talking about? I'm working. You go, I'm yeah. working with you. Or go straight ahead near Devil's Thumb. Mm -hmm. That corner right there was their ranch. But it was a sod roof cabin. One room. And since you missed the memorial for Elsie when Don Chubb gave his grandmother broke her leg the same day that Elsie was supposed to fall. So the doctor didn't get there in time. <laughs> because he was taking care of Chubb's dermal. Oh really? <laughs> and somebody whoever was acting as a midwife said Something about a boy when the doctor showed up and checked there and said, who the hell's trying to play games with me? This is not a boy, this is a girl. <laughs> and that was Elsie. Uh -huh. So August 19, 1922. Is that what you're after now? Mm -hmm. hey, no, they jumped to that. <laughs> Catching on, isn't he? He's a pretty smart guy. <laughs> Let me see if I can do something real quick. If I can remember where I put 32 words, well, what I had put on the plaque was from a sod roof, from a 1922 sod roof to Rocky Mountain Repertory Theater, to RFPT. That was the first line. Elsie Fletcher Rusk. And uh, with the, the picture of the side of cabin with her, her folks standing outside for the, somebody else with the team that had come to visit them. And so that was where I hung out on the seat there. Oh, that's great. I'll have to and look. I, I've got it hidden somewhere. I didn't. But <clears throat> my parents were Eastern Star, Dad of the Mason and so forth, and Elsie's parents were too. The lodge was Kremlin, and I'm talking about 1929, and so the, my parents and Elsie's parents would leave Elsie with me and my sister Jody <laughs> while they went to Kremlin to lodge meetings. And Elsie said I was mean to Jody, particularly when she messed her pants because I was embarrassed here. I was a big nine-year-old and Elsie was a seven-year-old. 
and my two-year-old sister was <laughs> embarrassing me. So anyhow, that is the romantic <laughs> entrance of our relationship. Well, the, it's, it's interesting it, that it they left you alone there. at nine and seven and two months, <laughs> two years. Mm -hmm. See, Judy was six, or almost seven years younger. And uh, Elsie was two months younger. It was August 19th, 22. Mm -hmm. And mine's October 13th, 20. And his instrument arithmetic's running through his head now. I didn't even have to look. <laughs> 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 and then you got married in 48? No, we were going to get married when I got to be 21. So my daddy didn't have to sign the marriage certificate. Oh. But my wife turned out to be a klutz, and she slipped and fell trying to rent cabins at her folks' place there in Hot Sulphur and broke her leg. And she was very sure that she didn't want to get married with a cast. And uh, so we put it off, and we said December 14th is our target date. Of 41. 41, December. Mm, got it. And uh, December 7th, our world blew up again. Mm -hmm. And we'd already fixed up Juniper Cabin down here, which is down here, it was my folks. We had our piano up there, and I had my household stuff, because I'd, I'd moved out from living with my house cause with a 12-year-old sister and a 6-year-old sister. You know, I was taking correspondence work from CU. And uh, this is too much BS for the yacht club, you know that? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so December 14th, you were supposed to get married, so then what happened? We got married. December 14th, you were still here? Yeah. yeah. And so we were about eight months together, and I went off. Signed up with Colonel Gibberley in the Costa Lake, Gus Spitzmiller, and Fred Belmar of the Ski Association, because I was, I used to, as a kid I used to ski at, go jumping meets around the state, mm -hmm. Homewood Park, and, and uh, Genesee Mountain, which is one of those, and Steamboat Springs. I was even on a program. How so? He's in the history museum too, you know. <laughs> like you're living history. Okay, so how did you start sailing? How did how did you get involved with the yacht club? Well, I I barely knew. Well, I knew there was a yacht club because I hung out at the beach a lot because my folks built a restaurant a couple of years later down the road at the cabins, and uh, so I would go over the hill there. And I would row. There were not trolling motors in those days, but I would roll fishermen around the lake for a dollar. And uh, then uh, Will Hofstadt, Gay Schaefer's uncle, who was one of the leading sailors here, and he, they had the sand pits behind the yacht club there where they put the sailboats, you know, mm -hmm. for winter. And you can get, they get them out and get them on the two before sand them and so forth, things like that, you know. So I'd hang around there and uh, he took a liking to me, I guess, because I'd sweep the yacht club and things like that. And he gave me one of the first brass medals, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, mm -hmm. less than 10 years old. I still have it. And then Chubb rejuvenated him, you know, made him out of pop metal. Or do you know? He didn't get him. What, Don's dad? No, Don himself. Don himself? Yeah. He did what? Yeah, these metals. That I know where the hell it is. Okay, that's sure. Bill Hofstadt gave me when I was a kid. Uh, Bill Hofstadt gave that to you? Mm hmm. I'm not holding very still. It's okay. And this is the one that Chubb had made. Mm -hmm. And I, I assume it was the same setting. And he gave these out some years back. I think it must have been when he was Commodore. And what do they say? Do they say anything? Nothing that I know of. But see, when they would have water sports and stuff, why these were the medals that they would give hmm. out for different things.
That, mm -hmm. that what you mean? Or? Well, so then when did you start sailing? Well, before that, I had a boat. I had my own boat when I was seven years old. One Billy Ives made. It cost me $25, flat bottom. <laughs> I got a picture of that, too. I do. I didn't have a jib, it was just a cat boat. But I nailed a cat back two before I and put, made it, put a jib for it. Found one hanging around the yacht, a little greasy and so forth, but it worked. And Bob Mayo would sail with me. And he was one of the guys that got killed during the war. He was a pilot. His folks had the place right down here below Chris. Three years and years. He oh, from Texas, Dallas, Texas. His dad was a banker and so forth. That house had been, oh, the name is gone, but he was one of the attorneys defending the Betcher kidnappers. Oh, Except yeah. he ended up with a little marked money, and so he spent his later years in the asylum. <laughs> so do you remember any of the activities at the Yacht Club from when you were a little kid? I didn't go. I mean... Well, they used to have street events up, up on Main Street. They, they sack races and stuff like that. The Yacht Club did? That I remember, you know, of course. Um, it was a dirt street. The, the main street in Grand Lake was the first pavement in Grand County. Really? Just the main street. So the Yacht Club had sack races and, and the regatta? And well, I think they did, did, with two stables on Main Street, too. Well, I'm sure we had some horse races and, mm -hmm. but you know, the dollar was a big thing in those days. Right. So, some of the prices are absolutely unbelievable, you know, I've found some of my folks' menus or stuff that mom had written, you know, how much was, different things were. Two bits for a sandwich, you know. So then, how did you start getting involved at the yacht club? Well, did you crew for somebody or no? How do, so? What what's the story there? Well, the Everest kids and I used to sail a lot, and then I got a better boat. I bought one that was Mallow's the snipe, and then uh, B. Hottie's great uncle. And Uncle Cannon, as their name, bought the sailboat for me after the war. Because I had it all during the war. It was a Don. It says Don down there in the basement. Is mm -hmm. mine. And because uh, I wanted the Chris Craft, it was after the war. And I bought the Chris Craft from Lou Millinger. And I sold that to help pay the bill on the Chris Craft. Must have been a real humdinger because I think I got uh, one or two hundred dollars out of it, you know. But, <laughs> but uh, Daryl Cannon won qu quite a few races because they handicapped it pretty good for him. It's one of the smaller boats. And uh, well, I don't know, of course, I grew up with the Hall kids, Evers kids, Peak kids, and also we were just all friends. And, Les Thompson when he came along, you know. And of course, Les was driving a PT boat down the New Hebrides when I was in, but I didn't know about it. Gordon Spitzmiller was on the Saratoga. He was across the bay in the dry docks. And I saw him. That, uh, oh, I just, he was smaller, much smaller. Everybody knew everybody. It was a friendly family type operation in the old days, you know. I was always at lunch over at Evers. Nanny Evers had me under there all the time. I was up sailing with the kids and I sailed with Campbell's. Our folks sailing there was, well, I'm not sure it was a niece or a nephew or something, like but they had two nice lap straight wooden boats and who was I don't even know who he was, but he was one of a Campbell, though I know. And uh, they had some nice big beach umbrellas. <laughs> and so we would 
get out there at the lake, and hang the beach umbrellas, and go down to Adam's house, you know, and then row back, and then put up the beach umbrella. And go down there. So, and how many? <laughs> about how many cat? Well, so who was the the Chubs were? The, the I'm trying to think of the cabins that would have been here, the Everest, and the Peaks, and the Adams, and the Chubs, and Patience Camp. And she was. But she wasn't involved in the yacht club. But she would have came in. Uh, yeah. You you hit one. I'm not going to say anything. Okay. <laughs> and and was there anything? Uh, there was the hall, the hall house. Anything else on that side of the lake then? Oh yeah, Adams house where Dudley Abbott. Was. Adams and so forth. And Keister and Batty was a duplex. Keister on one end, Batty's on the other. And there were several houses that been torn down over there through the years. And the buttrooms on this side, buttrooms? Oh, that was a later one. Later? The, originally, well, there was just Judge Pettengill's house, which is now Dalton's. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Elson and I got married, right, the judge wanted us to buy his house because he was getting more, more feeble and still had a wife. And she was a minor, which you see down here by the bridge, right? The, that house is a minor, and it's got a historical mm -hmm. sign on it, I remember. So, but anyhow, there was one house out by, similar to where uh, um, oh, well, the Commodore has been remodeling all winter, Dan Wilhelm's. Mm -hmm. It was just, there was two, so, or Buttrams were there, wasn't even there, there wasn't anything out there. That whole area was just nothing but mosquitoes and Swampland, you know, and uh, the judge wanted El Snyder to buy the house and said, I was working at the tunnel at the time, and there's no way I'd had to shovel snow from there to wherever the snowplow came. And in 1935, I, we were snowed in enough, and um, Dad and I kept the road shoveled from where Chris lives to the end of Main Street. And it snowed and it snowed and snowed because, well, a long, I don't know if you want to shut it off, it's a long-winded story or not, but anyhow, uh, of course, in those days, no telephones, mm -hmm. or whatever telephones, but my parents didn't have any. But Mom was a great writer and teacher and so forth, so she kept in contact with a lot of people in Iowa and had a letter from people from Tucson. They were talking about how snowy it was. Said, "We'll come to Tucson. We, there's another cabin down here up this valley where we are. So you can rent for twenty-five dollars a month. And it's just a one-room cabin, but it's sound. It's got roof over it, and two double beds, nice cooking stove that warms it, and so forth. So Dad borrowed enough money for borrowed, and I have no idea of the amount." He'd written for it you know, from his World War One life insurance, and uh, Lon Osborne was the mail carrier, and he used to go with a pickup to get the mail from the and the mail in those days. Well, you get it at the depot and bring it up to to Grand Lake, and uh, finally the road was closed and because it used to be down under Granby Reservoir, and every time there was a hump, why that would drift full and so forth, he couldn't get through. So he started doing it with a team and and a sled, <coughs> and then he couldn't even get through with that. So he's riding just a saddle horse, and he'd bring back first-class mail only. Well, the, the money came, but we couldn't get out of town. So <laughs> Chris, we were still shoveling. I was a teenager, you know, 15 years old at the time. And uh, so Dad and I shoveled from the house there down to the end of Main Street. And it seemed like it snowed about at least, a, I th was thinking every day, but probably was every other day, you know. But, the snowbanks, I know, were high enough we were throwing stuff clear up over and over, getting narrower at the same time. Finally, while the, the word spread through town, the, the snowplow's coming and the bread truck's right behind it. If anybody wants to get out, my time to do it now. And Clyde Essie called two pregnant women out in the back of his pickup, all warmed up with blankets and stuff, covered up. <coughs> I don't know where I got this. Do you want some water? <coughs> I got a crud from something, hay season or something, but anyhow, 
I know Dad borrowed chains for the car. Give him back, send him back to Grand Lake with whoever it was. I don't remember uh, the trip at all, except that we ended up at this place down in Tucson, or down south of Tucson, which you know, was directly across the road from Green Valley. If anybody's familiar with Green Valley and so forth, Continental was the railroad stop. There was a train going to Nogales and on down into Mexico. It was up in that valley. And we had a fabulous time down there. There was a CCC camp of veterans of World War One. Mm -hmm. So they're about my dad's Some age. Young people may not know what the CCC stands for. Civilian Conservation Corps. <clears throat> and this was a program, I guess, who was president at that time. I guess. Roosevelt. Hmm? Roosevelt. I don't know. Anyhow. Yeah, during the CCC, Roosevelt. That was one of his. Pro was that one of his? Mm -hmm. 35 would have been, yeah. I don't know how long. He was still president when the war mm -hmm. came along. Yeah, until 44. He was doing a long time. <coughs> you know, 1932 Hoover, Hoover to 1940. Yeah, 32 Hoover. to 44. Anyhow, uh, they were having activities for these guys. And I, I haven't found anybody in Tucson who knows that it was veterans and older people. You know, everybody thought they were teenagers and kids because that really was set up, you know. And part of the money went home to the parents, you know, if you had. Mm -hmm. You had six or eight boys while you, the folks at home got a pretty good pittance, you know. So uh, anyhow, they had uh, craft work, you know. One of the things was we made, well, copper was cheap and silver was high price. And we made everything we could from ashtrays to letter openers to... This is left over before. The swastikas became popular, mm -hmm. so that is a swastika rather than the Indian type. The left hand poopy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you taking a photograph of the dust? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> patina, patina. Oh, cool. <clears throat> Last fall, I never cleaned it up. Lots of patina, huh? But this was a ashtray, but this was IKI, which was Iron Kettle Inn, which was the hmm. folks' restaurant. Oh, side. really? And this was genuine copper, of course. And the stuff we got. And then we got into this one guy there, he was uh, getting where, rattlesnakes. Where was the Iron, Iron Kettle Inn? Main Street of Grand I know, but where? What, what? What's there now? Next to the pine cone, it would be uh, Avis's place before she moved across the street. By Poncho and Lefties. Yeah. First one next to the pine Between cone from Avis's. Oh, okay. Poncho's. Okay, got it. And they had two cabins up on the hill later on. <clears throat> and Father Barry was a young priest at that time. And Uh, just more or less acting as the uh, learning priest, whatever he would be. He would come up from Denver, you know, and he, the Catholic Church was over there by Harrington. It was on Harrington's land, and he preached them. And of course, later, why he was. Uh, well, like during the war, he was trying to uh, do bingo games and stuff like this, because he would stop in down to see Margaret and Elsie, because uh, Margaret was the ration board, Elsie was the draft board, and he was hustling coupons and so forth. Like I said, he could use his prizes for the bingo games, <laughs> so we had some extra gas. Oh, right. So the father would come down there and <coughs> he was a good buddy of Margaret particularly because she was a pretty flashy lady. What now what, you, you were talking about the Harrington land is 
And was and the Catholic Church was over there. What else was still over there at that time? Because that used to be downtown, kind of. Well, there were a lot of houses there. Of course, the Spider House and some of the others, and then oh, this I'm trying. I'm having a hard time coming up with a name. I know her name. Her, she has a sister, and she worked at the. West or the mountain climbing stuff. Oh, Oral? Burtis? Burtis. Yeah, Oral and her sister. Yeah, My parents used to They ever had. Burtis was a Ford dealer in Kansas, I think, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure he is. Yeah. So that was there. The, around the corner was Mrs. Adams right there. And then the, the public land that goes, it isn't just Main Street, it goes clear on over. Mm -hmm. But Pete Harrington. Pulled a sneaky and he went down and talked to the commissioner. It'd be all right to put a boathouse there. Hmm. So the boathouse is on what was really part of Grand Avenue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then he put fences all along the other. So mm -hmm. you think, oh, this is private property. But anybody could go over there and use it if they wanted to express, start a civil war. <laughs> now, who was Pete Harrington? Hmm? Who was Pete Harrington? Did you say Pete? Uh huh. Who? What's the, what's, was he? He'd be Grandpa. What, uh, Martin Sr.'s brother? Uncle, or father. Father, okay. Or no. Yeah. Martin. Yeah. So. No, 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 no. Which Martin? Well, Martin, Martin Sr., who's deceased, was it his father? So it's this Martin's grandfather. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And he married an O'Fallon. Right. If I remember right, and so the plumbing distributor in Denver was Crane O'Fallon. I think. I think I'm right on that. But Martin Senior and I were buddies. He was a couple of years older than I was, but he had a red convertible. We hustled all the girls to Haps Holiday Pancake House, or, <laughs> or when it was before that, where it was chicken in the rough with a basket of fried chicken, you know. So this is like when you were in high school? I wasn't married yet. Yeah. Okay, so okay, so talk about some of the people from the yacht so you used to hang around with Martin Harrington and Senior. who who else from the yacht club did you used to hang around with before you got married? It was primarily it. George Peake was always having to play with his sister, so he was a little strange <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we will edit that comment about <laughs> George although, Peake. Although everybody yeah. already knows it, so. But, but poor George, you know, he, he has three sisters, and he never came to town to play with us kids with beanies, you know, or shooting squirrels or <laughs> golf gophers down on the pair of the well, sagebrush flats. And so, what else did he have? But doll houses and dolls to play with up on the beach, the yeah. other end. And it was a long walk or on a road to get there. Right. And he had to roll because probably the old man wouldn't let him use six peaks to get to town. So. And he was the youngest of the tribe, I think, wasn't he? I think he was, yeah. yeah. He got pretty uptown where he got a boat of his own, you know. So Harvey Everest, did you? I mean, I was trying to think of who you mentioned before. Gene and, Gene and uh, Howard. Let's see. Gene and I were, well... I ran the theater for a few years. Which theater? Here? Yeah, movie here. Mm -hmm. When we first started. And that had to be 35, 36 probably because we didn't have electricity until 1935. Everybody had ice houses, no refrigerators, and everybody had either their own light plant or gas lamps. So, so Grand Lake didn't have electricity until 1935? Oh. No, unless you had your own light plant. Right. <laughs> well, you see, the, rap, the lodge was running off their Pelton wheel on Tommy Huda Creek. There was a dam. That, I don't know if you ever walked up there in the old days when the dam was still there. Mm -hmm. And they had pipe came down. And then, of course, the flume started right over here to go to the rapids. Mm -hmm. And switch did the rapids hotel, Dad Ish's house, and the pine cone in. And for a while, I, uh, that's a restaurant, which is right next door, why? They got electricity, and then we had to get our own light plant because it didn't have enough oomph. So, 
And then when Don Woods and Mike Morrison came to town with Paul Polly as their deer and grunt man, why, that's when it started. So, okay, so now t tell us about how you got involved in the Yacht Club when you were a, an hey, adult. Hmm? One of the things Brian O'Donnell said, Mac Chris, if you're going to keep sailing the boats, why don't you join the Yacht Club? I said, I can't afford to. And I, didn't, I had no shingle out at that time because I thought it was a high dollar joint. And I think it was $25 to join the Yacht Club. And, what, and when was this? What? I don't remember. Well, about about when? Pick a decade. Yeah. How old were the, were the kids still at home? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in the 60s? <laughs> yeah. Because the first, my first, see, I was sailing at Emma with Merle Brewer. With Merle Brewer? Um. So is that when you joined the Yacht Club in the 60s? And who'd you sail with? Well, my first East Cal was a partnership with Merle Brewer, Dick Russell, and me. And Merle Brewer was... Somebody dreamed up the idea we should swap boats sometime. Uh, and there was a party over at Campbell's, and I said, and our boat was pretty new. And I said, well, I don't want to swap boats. And Merle Brewer decided I was had hen-house ways. And he was very mad at me. He cussed me out there and so forth. So we sort of parted company and Dick Russell and I bought him out. And first thing you know, Dick and Harriet get her divorce. And Dick's going to California, so Harriet gets the Volk partnership. So that's how we end the yacht, the Lipton Cup was Chris, Elsie, and Harriet, and me. <laughs> Did you mention that that's when you won the Lipton Cup? Hmm? Did you mention that that's when you won the Lipton Cup? Yeah. Yeah. And that was just, that was you and Harriet and Elsie? Was there anybody else on the boat? Chris. Oh, Chris. Chris was you. And Harriet and Elsie were ballast. Yeah, that was in the 70s, right? That was right before. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, before I come over, I got a picture of Annie O'Donnell. He's coming in, he's dressed up as a pink panther. So, how did you decide on the name Pink Panther for your boat? Elsie. We were up snowmobiling, and she had a new pair of sunglasses, and she, we we had the boat ordered, but that was it, but that's all we knew. And uh, she put on these pink glasses after being somebody else, and, oh, the snow is pink with these glasses. There was about the time the Pink Panther and the Inspector was popular movies, you know. So that's what happened. And then I found out later from Bruce O'Donnell, and he was going to school up in you know, Seattle area. This guy said he used to work with the Johnson Boat Works. And, uh, so Bruce said, oh, you might have heard of Grand Lake then. I said, no, you never heard of Grand Lake. He said, well, you got to remember, there was one boat that you would be outstanding. He said, it was a, a boat with a pink deck. He said, yeah, yeah, we remember that. <laughs> and I never knew, but when I went back there to pick up the boat, well, I'd called for the motel, said, be there in a few minutes. There were all these Swedes are out in front wanting to see if I had lace pants or what, or if I was buying a pink boat. And so we had to put a black racing stripe down to sort of back us off a little bit, you know. So that was panther number one. How many pink panthers did you have? This tree number three now is the 2000 Millennium boat. With multiple upgrades and dollars. So now th tell us about some of your best memories with like Munn and Lynch and Mitchell and all, all the... Yeah. 
fabulous people. She was scally, of course, and Jim were down the line. And they asked me to be Commodore. Being the first Grand Laker to ever get on board, you know, other than at the, well, Pettengill, who was a judge. Anyway, uh, quite an honor. And, uh, what can I say? Outside of fabulous times, Jim was an extremely dear friend. Some of those times are, shouldn't be on the record. <laughs> Mary Lou is a very great person. But she's been able to spend more time the last few years here than recently. Johnson is here. This is Mark Johnson here. His husband and wife here in Johnson Boat Works. So, and then this photo is the Lipton Cup winning team. In some year, we don't remember. It'll be on the cup. With Chris and Harriet and Elsie and Mac. Mm -hmm. Harriet Russell. Hmm. That was one of the first vinegars on Grand Lake. The big old ball. They were about to outlaw me. 13, that's, your, that's yours. Yeah. I remember that spinnaker. This is when I this is when I was the rescue boat. This, Jim. Oh. this is pictures they put on the cover in the uh, magazine, except they cut it off right here. And this is oh, Jim and, there's Jim and Munn, the Jim Lynch, Mac. Oh, there. That's one that they cut off right here. This was the Commodore, and this is the Vice Commodore, and this is the Rear Commodore. So Jim Lynch, Scally O'Donnell, and Mac Russ. And that would have been about 1978? No, except before that, because yeah. you were Commodore in 79? No. Yeah. Just a year or two ago. Oh, there, that's a good picture. Same one. Oh, that's great. There you go. You already got Oh. <laughs> the Please don't cup. take very long. And the peak cup. And I'm sure somebody's told the story of the Lipton cup. This was Panther too. Sorry. <clears throat> oh, so, oh, that's right. This is about you. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at all. The audio actually doesn't go off when I take photos. I know, but pictures. you've taken it. That's when we were heading some of your races on Grand Lake. That was Chris's double track. <laughs> on Grand Lake or on Shadow Mountain? Grand Lake. That's where this picture was taken. I'm pretty sure. That was me and that was Chris with you. Right here. And then we sold it and, and that sled won the world. This was second in the world at that time and then we sold it. And this was not a... He had double zero as his race number with the association. But this was the one that was the fastest of the batch. <laughs> so Mac, tell me about your most memorable race. That's Lene, that's his daughter. One of the most disappointing ones in the old days if you hit somebody, you were out. You had to go home. And I had the Lipton Cup one. I only had to finish this one race. And I came around the peak mark, a little few aggressive and happy as the world, and spun it around. And I just started white, just touched him. I took down the sails and paddled it home. I was just broken uh -huh. You know the one I'll never I've been forget. Like that. And you admit you might want to hear some of these because these are some cla these were some classic races. Remember the one where you were ahead by 
Quite a lot, Campbell. And yeah. Oh no man. Wind. And everybody went down the lake, and Richard Campbell by and said, "Oh, I'm so sorry." And said, "Well, quit being behind us." Am I taking Who's the that, picture? Who's that, My dad. Oh, it is. Before he passed away. Huh. Now he got to him. Look at that face. This is at the Mun residence. Mm -hmm. Well, there's your mom and dad. Yeah. That's Jody's that, husband. And that's Herb Jody. Leach. This is She was a Lehman type. His mother was Lehman. Of course, mother and dad. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> that was Chris. We could, we could use that for bribery. Oh. I can't Sorry. let you have it. <laughs> are, are, are you recording? Yeah. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I, I can't take photos. I have to only record. <laughs> so you need to keep this the mouth five <laughs> shut. Five the or uh, fire department. They retired. This was about when the Johnson and Johnson was here having special deals. So far, this was the old goats of town at the time. John Petty still alive. And Paul Linton's alive. Me. And this is There's my mom and dad in Arizona. And they an officer candidate school in the Marine Corps. Biggie, he was holding his hands behind the This is when I was up in the Arctic. A group of us went up in the Arctic. A bunch of these were trainees from Canada, and I was just me down in front with my own outfit on. This Pat Henry put on a dummy right beside the bar and left that on. That was me, water skin. My dad took that one night and then I did up. One of my favorite ones. It was just sunset was just right. That's really cool. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Nowhere near it. No. And what I started with. When the kids were little. Mexico in the old days. Linnaeism. This is Mexico too. Chris growing up. Chris and Linnae. This is my good looking wife. And this is when we first started the snowmobile business. This is Chris. He got hired than I did. <laughs> Not by much. So, what other stories do you want to tell us? Hmm? What other stories do you want to tell us? Well, they just come and go, you know. I, if I have to live, try to remember something, I can't. Mm -hmm. but, you know, like Scally and I get together and talk and remember old things. And, well, it's surprising how stuff will come back. So, what's your favorite Commodore? What's the. I really didn't think favorites really that much. Well, or just tell us one of the, one of the things that you remember. All I can see is dust on my table. <laughs> Look up. <laughs> and my books. I don't know, is it? Fabulous bunch of people. I was extremely fond of Pat Henry. Grumpy old girl. We had some crazy times. Uh, Jim Lynch and Jane. Scally was great. I can't think of any that were that I disliked. Well, tell us the tell us the Pat Henry story. Yeah, 
Elsie that really don't know. Of course, Elsie and I went with them to, there was a big push going on for keelboats, you know, the seniors as such. So we went to California with Pat and Jenny to buy a keelboat. That was a fun trip. But, you know, I don't know, you know. Well, tell us about how you used to get your boat, since you don't live on the lake, where did you store your boat? I mean, I. how did you, tell me about your cruise and... I always had a garage somewhere or other. When I had it in the yacht club. The pa when we had the Panthers, I started putting it in the yacht club. And then I built the shed over here. Now it's a building. It's all closed in. Now it's uh, holds the girls M16. Uh, Panther, and Chris's four winds. I did have room for three older vintage snowmobiles once upon a time, but when Becca graduated and they shut down her household in Missoula, why Chris had to go get a big trailer. So the, so the skiers are outside, and Becca's household goods are in the <laughs> one wing of the building. Didn't you, didn't you used to, in the summer, keep your boat over by lunches? Didn't you have a slip over? Didn't you well, sell yeah, out of it? A bunch of us used See, I got, way back when, I got permission from the Bureau of Reclamation to have my rack over there where Point Park is. And then others, starting with Roscoe and Zachman's and so forth, they kind of moved in there, and then they, but they didn't get around to asking them. Then the town took over, and so we all got kicked out. So, but years years ago, at the time I was in the yacht club, I did. business people were in the yacht club. Zick threw in the yacht club. The druggist Jeff Snyder was on it. I think Matilda Humphrey was the one, because they would, you know. <coughs> In the less than fifty dollar goods, why? They, and uh, in those those early days, why the light plant from the boat service is what would light the thing up. And then, of course, a lot of times they have the, the Commodore's ball with the pine cone. So it's it's so different, you know, now. And thank God it got changed, you know. Because if anything had ever happened to it, well, the, new, the rules would, would not be able to rebuild there. So, luckily I found out through a friend that the bank and steam mill had Pierce's note was wanting to sell the property. They foreclosed on him. And uh, so I got with Jock and Jim Lynch. And Ed Morrow was mad at me. He didn't want to do it because he said, oh, you just because you're a builder, you want to develop it there. And I said, finally, I got through his thick head that we didn't have anything there. We were really thinking for a club, so got it all put together, and it works fabulous. The beautiful lakefront now, so much different. And I just stopped down to see the guy who did all the rock busting for me. He's building a new building down in Grandy there. <coughs> and, uh, I hadn't seen him since he did my sewer and water here, or sewer and, uh, well, I guess that was it. That's the last thing he did for me here. Mm -hmm. Steve Board is his name. Done real well with construction. He does concrete and uh, blasting now. He's the first one that I ever knew that just instead of using dynamite, why they just drill the hole and they expand it. Yeah, hydraulics and break rocks without problems. Yeah. Real good kid, just done real well. 
so many people die. And it just, the Thompsons, who, where they had a little Ford digger when they dug my swimming pool out here years ago. And uh, now it's just two of the boys, all the rest of the family's dead. Two other boys, and the daughter still, there is the daughter still, works out at the city market. So, as Cousin Jim says, don't fall down and don't get sick. <laughs> <clears throat> Tell us about, like, Main Street. What, some of, some of the buildings you remember, the restaurants, the store, like Zick's, and some of the buildings that are changed a lot. Well, uh, down, starting down at the far end, there were crab trees, of course. There was just a little log building. That the Johnsons had a little soda fountain in there. Just, that was all there was, a soda fountain. An ice house out back. And next was the mercantile building. And uh, in some of my mom's diaries, my dad worked there in the wintertime one time. and. It was supposed to be $25 a month. And, or he was supposed to take half of it in groceries. And he said sometimes they'd take it all in groceries because there wasn't enough cash flow at that grocery store. And then about where the, I can't remember who built it. There's a big new building there, it used to be Little cabin was a little bakery in this little garden. Even Mrs. Summers had it, and she—I don't remember what. I know she did some baking there. And then somewhere about 1935, why Grumpy's was built for Bill Walker, who had been the theater or had been the, the photo developing and professional photographer, whatever was happening, and. At Humphreys, and then he apparently got crossways Vince Humphrey and built that building down there. And it started out as a three level, you go in on the town level, that was the main entrance. You go down three steps underneath, and that was his living quarters and the dark room stuff down there. You go up steps, there was a soda fountain up there, and the drug supplies. And we had a little young guy who was the druggist, Jimmy Gleason, I remember was his name. Too. Friendly with him. Then there, I don't think there's anything but the old elk cabin, which sets behind where the brewery is now, you know. That was torn down. And then, of course, where the mine design, there was the telephone office. And there was live in telephone operators. Live in? They lived in the building with the telephone office. One room was the telephone office. Two telephone booths out on the porch. There was screened in, but that was it, I think. <coughs> and then, it was next was uh, Spitzmiller built the building there where Pat Jones is with the red sled. The little part that used to be on it was the barber shop and the rental for the cabins. Then the next portion was the drugstore, which was Jerry Farrell. And then the next part of it was which would be half of the, oh, what's... Never Summer? Hmm? Never Summer? Never Summer? Yeah. That shop? Never Summer? Yeah, that shop? Never Summer. That was the post office. Mm -hmm. And then later, when REA took over the electricity from the private people, they put their office there, and I know my sister worked there as clerk for the Mountain Parks Electric. <coughs> Later it became the Swedes' Lincolnberry Pancake House. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, of course, now I never summer's taking over all of it. And Pat has expanded into the, they took down the wall between the Barber shop and her part. And the toilet is in there too, which is 
in there. So that gave her plumbing in there. And of course the theater used to be able to drive into the theater right up to the front door there. And I know I, I was running out in about 36 in the drum of the year before. And uh, that was started by a fellow called Harry Gammon, that was his name. He was a 90-day Wonder Park Service guy and married into the Seeley family where uh, oh, the twin sister lives down here by Mitchell. But she's married. There are two sisters. I don't know who that is. One was at the Northern area, they weren't there. Anyhow. These were kinfolk to Doc. Oh, okay. So uh, See, Nancy hmm? Nancy Senior? No. No no relation to Nancy. Okay. Either. On Jock's side. On Jock's side, you know. And uh, Crabtree's wife was a Mitchell, too. But anyhow, he was the one that started the theater. And I don't know how I got the job being the first, his first employee. Well, I was everything there was there, from getting the chewing gum out from under his seats to <laughs> sweeping out and putting up the advertising. We had little frames that we put around all the motels and hotels. So we the theater was, you know, what was playing. Started out as having one one showing a night and then later got into two shows. And then of course Zix changed a lot. And that was the restaurant was the first thing you came to right on the corner. And the next was the, the uh, Groceries, and then there was a little hardware section, and there was a, you could drive back to the cabins that were along there. Mm -hmm. yeah, so the sagebrushes now, mm -hmm. remember? Hmm? Yeah. We'd sweep with a sagebrush. Six grocery store. And I remember we used to we used to go in, and you could either pay at the beginning of the summer or pay at the end of the summer, mm -hmm. but it was the old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. Down at uh, the blacksmith shop in Kremlin, right? Dan Hoare was a Swiss blacksmith for a hundred years, you know. And uh, he had a turntable type thing about so big around with all the books that at each bo book was a different ranch, you know. And he'd keep track of it. And when they sold their hay in the fall, everybody came in and paid up their book. And I was, building down there, the hospital and the cl clinic and stuff. Where I had a book there because he sharpened my picks and all that good stuff. He, he was... This is strictly on Dan Hoare, the plumber. The, I went down to see him one morning to do something to get something done. And he was stirring something. And I, I said, how are things going, Dan? I said, not very good. They don't, I got the miseries and so forth. I said, what's your fixing? He said, he said, by God, I'm going to fix it. My stomach's all dried up. And he said, and he says, I'm mixing some soda and water. And he said, I'm going to drink that. And then I take a big shot of vinegar, and by God, something's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> and and uh, he had glasses for... We drilled it. He made little tiny holes right behind, in front of his pupils, so that he looked through. He could see apparently up close. I assume nearsighted, so he could look through that. And it was enough coverage there. He didn't get sparks in his eyes or yeah. grindings and so forth. But you see a little oval cut into his glasses right there behind his pupils. <laughs> Didn't have to wipe them or anything. They'd be so ugly and dirty on the outside. But you could see right through to his eyeballs, you know. So, trying to remember what, what was what was next to Zix. Remember? Well, we'd have been 
what is now the art gallery, which was Bill's Cafe. Oh, that's the Run by Cora. Cora was the wife. Is that what you mean? Yeah, because, yeah, that was before my time. And Zix, Zix expanded. They tore down the cabins and mm -hmm. got farther over. There it goes. <laughs> Six. You asked me about six, didn't you? <laughs> this was Bill's Cafe there before. They'd, this is part of Zix here, see? And what's this over here? This will give you an idea of what Zix looked like. This is the cabins. This is the corner of Bill's Cafe, and this is one of the cabins. They went lengthways back towards the alley. This was the cafe, the market, and the hardware. Who's this? Me. <laughs> Getting close up here just in case. It's not very focused. This is very difficult. The outlet in the old is. First boat. That's my father with a full size rowing type oar. He was wearing his hip boots. That was the day I got my first boat. Mm. <laughs> this is Elsie on the roof of the lodge when they were shoveling one day. I'm trying to find her. I got the sneaking to the Mickey. And this was the yacht club fleet in the old fleet in the old days. Can you what year that is? Uh, it doesn't say. Yeah. No, it doesn't. This is taken from down by. Is the rock mm. still in there or not? No. Mm -mm. Because this is what the boat service looked like in the old days. Mickey was even in a dock there on that one. What's the Mickey? It was a tour boat for the boat service. And it sunk? Mm -hmm. It sunk? Did you say well, that? We, I got pictures when they took it out and sunk it. Oh, they sunk it on purpose? Yeah. Were you there? Yeah. Will you tell us about that story? <laughs> That's the other end of the main street. That's the old days. This, these slots here, that was at the chuck hole.
this, this is the old days. This is where I used to keep my Chris Craft. That's it right there. Yep. Never. That's all I can do. That. <laughs> so tell us about the sinking of the Mickey. This is on what before Shadow Mountain Lake. Huh. This was way into town. From where? This is well, Down by Mun? Would be Marina Drive by nowadays standards. Marina Drive. Is this, is this close to the same road into town? The, the location where it is now? The little marina is right in here on Soda Creek. Okay. And it's all. Uh, the Shadow Mountain Marina. Yeah. I just saw the thing a this ago. is from the road junction. It's the same photo. It's different, but it's the same place. Yeah, I, I know it's so. this, this is right after Killian built oh. this new marina type thing. All those cabins were part of Roan's green roofments here. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. the baby, this was a step of house, and then one of those long to Wetzel's. And this, this shows where that road starts. If you turned around and looked the opposite direction from that picture, same picture, that was the motel that was out there. It was El Navajo. Shadow Mountain Yacht Club is there. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes sense to mm -hmm. you. You're explaining what you were asking about the Ziggs. Yeah, you got a big load for nothing. <laughs> so tell us about when you sunk the Mickey. Well, she's got the Mickey pictures. <laughs> tell us about it. <laughs> pictures may not work because that camera doesn't focus on pictures very well. Just but it was talking. a boat. I'll, if I find a picture of a boat, I'll tell you. Well, I was it put the Mickey in and uh, filled it full of rocks and she was on fire and it sunk. Why it was, did you do it? Well, you wanted to get rid of it. Well, why did you want to get rid of it? <laughs> hmm? Why did you want to get rid of it? Because it was old and they didn't use oh, it anymore okay. at the boat service. It used to have a fence all the way around the upper decks and so forth, and they had folding chairs up on it and take people for tours around. About when was that? Well, the 30s. Because I used to, as a little kid, I used to play on it. I when they were working on it. Well, anyhow, they took the superstructure off of it and all that sort of stuff. And the next morning, why the thing was floating again? <laughs> After you put rocks in it and set it on fire, mm -hmm. <laughs> it disappeared and went down. Started apparently as it went down and rolled over and dumped the rocks and came back up <laughs> the next morning. So I had to build another fire. So then, what did you do? They did it again. Started over again. More rocks and more fire. <laughs> it took the couple of days to sink the sucker. I figured it had more eyes. Apparently, Captain McCarty bought it. Uh, no, sinking of the Mickey, 1954. That's not, that's not the Mickey. Right. What's it say on the back? It says sinking of the Mickey, 1954, but 
the, I don't think the Mickey's on there. Yeah. Isn't this Mickey right there? Oh, well, maybe. Was it white? White. Yeah. Okay. Here's what we're talking about. If you can see it. Put your hand. <laughs> this is a great photo. we got some photo. better ones. That's huh? a great photo. I think that was taken about the first year we were I was home from the clam bake. It doesn't say it what doesn't year. Say on the back, so. It doesn't say a year. Yeah. It says how come it took so long? I don't know, apparently. We're looking forward to somebody seeing you one of these days soon. Apparently we'd send it to somebody and they sent it back. Sent back. How come it took so long? You're just thinking of the Mickey. Yeah, that looks like an ivy. Yeah. Here's the Mickey. Okay. Which they sunk twice. In Chris. 1954. Yeah. Mac Linnae and Chris. Yep. It had to be about 57. Because <laughs> we went to. T t t we took a boat down. The and went to Tiakapan and. The estuary down there, where they're going to go water ski with this boat. That's you, isn't it? No, it's Sam Huntington Southern. Oh. Sam Huntington. That's a hot summer, but it shows where I lived. I think. It doesn't say. Yep, been through them all. No, that's well, we bet. Okay, I'll use this as a pointer. If I can do it upside down. This is a courthouse. What town are we in? Hmm? Oh, in Hot Sulphur? Mm -hmm. This was the jail, and this was our house. This was the McLean house. And Elsie lived there. There's a church here somewhere across the street. Uh, let me spin it just a tweak here. Now, this was Elsie's house right here. And this is a ski jumper. And that was Sam <laughs> and I was on the jumping hill at Hot Sulphur. You see the red much there, and that's the old original courthouse. And so here and there, there where they were buddies, and that's when I was saying Margaret and Elsie. Well, I know that there's there's only two hours on this tape, and we've been here almost two hours, so I'm trying to think of what... This is Margaret and me showing you all the time. Uh -huh. When I visited her, it was her 95th birthday. Look at that waist. <laughs> yep. so you haven't got much for the yacht club because I don't know much about the yacht club, but I don't believe that for a second. I think we've got a lot though. Well, I, I think the important thing much. is that we talk about Grand Lake and your 88 years of being here. Eight. I guess I was wrong. It's 91 80. minus 8. It's 83. 83 years of being here. Where's that? Well, Mac, is there anything you'd like to say in closing about your life in Grand Lake? <laughs> I'm ready for a recycle. I'd like to go around again and see what the changes are going to be because I've been through so many things through the years. And it's all been fun. Go to every second of it. Fabulous people. I'm trying to get to. I 
I should have started from the other end, I think. There. That's what Margaret looks like at 95. Hmm. She looks pretty good. Sharp as a tack. Unbelievable. Because she's in Tucson, isn't she? No, it's in Denver. Oh, it's in Denver. Yeah. And she quit dyeing her hair a couple years ago. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. He said, Mac, you and I are the only ones that are left around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think we're... we're well, I'm ready. sorry, I don't know more about the Yacht Club. Oh, well, we Maybe don't. I'm... The Yacht Club stuff, we, you know, we yeah, have yeah. it. It's no big deal. Um, but if you don't have <coughs> anything else you would like to say, I'll turn this off. Mm. Some of this stuff I'll throw away, but no, 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 no. I was, I was telling the kids, I about all the times that when I was walking by with my coffee, and you and Elsie and I would sit around that table and go through pictures, and we could do this for two hours every day and scratch the surface. <laughs>